My name is Rebecca Kiesling, and I am the executive director of NAMI Northern Virginia. I'm so grateful to everyone to being here tonight for our second of 2024 community wellness education event. Um, it's the beginning of Eating Disorder Awareness Week. Um, and so this is the perfect time to have this particular event, um, bringing in something that, you know, we don't really talk a lot about. When I was young, eating disorders were blamed on society's obsession with being thin. Uh, people believe that eating disorders were only really a threat and something that happened to teenage girls. Um, we know now that nearly 29 million people in the U.S. alone are going to be impacted by an eating disorder at some point in their life. Um, I'm not going to get into everything that Christy's going to talk about, but where this is in most interesting to me, because I am really fascinating by, fascinated by what we call co-occurring disorders, so having one or more mental illnesses occurring at the same time. Um, there's a study that says that at least 2,400 people dealing with eating disorders, out of those 2,400 people, 94% of them, 94% had at least one other mental health condition. That's, an out, out, that's just an astounding number to me when I read that. Um, I'm really excited to introduce everyone today um, to Rock Recovery and to Christy, the, their executive director. Rock Recovery is one of the only nonprofits in the entire country that is providing support, clinical treatment, and education programs on eating disorders and mental health issues. Um, it's so vitally important that this information is getting to the right people, and the right people is every people. So um, I'm really excited to introduce you to Christy and take it away. Um, you can please put any questions into the chat. Um, and then my team um, from NAMI Northern Virginia is going to be watching those. And at the end, we will jump back in with Christy. All right. Thanks, Rebecca. I really appreciate that really kind introduction. And we love partnering with you and are always very impressed by all of the things that you all are doing in our area. So thank you for having me. Um, I will be sharing my screen. So I always joke when I'm presenting that the most stressful thing I do is IT related, and I don't know that that will ever change. So at least there's no videos tonight. But um, if you ever can't hear me, just let me know. Someone can yell off mute. I won't be offended. You can always interrupt me. But um, I hate to say happy Eating Disorders Awareness Week, but, you know, we are, in fact, kind of honoring this week together. And Rebecca hit it perfectly with all the things that we're seeing with this, the millions of Americans that are struggling, the lack of people who are getting treatment, and just the fact that there's no shame in, in struggling with any mental health concern or condition, let alone an eating disorder, and that people struggle well past sort of the stereotypes that we've been misled to believe through media and all kinds of other things, which we'll go into detail on that a little bit. But one thing that I always like to share and disclose up front is that I am personally recovered from an eating disorder. So I joke, you know, I hang out with therapists all day long, but I don't, but I'm not one. It's very sad. I have no fancy letters behind my name, but I have a story and I have experience of getting to speak to thousands of people in the community who have their own stories as well. And I do hang out with therapists all day long, which I also highly recommend. So everyone's journey is different. Everyone's story is different. But I'm hoping some of what we talk about here tonight will be helpful to you, be educational and be empowering, because we all know somebody who is struggling with an eating disorder. And um, for anyone that wants more information, we'll go over a little bit about our recovery services as well. So let me share my screen and make sure I do this the correct way. All right. Here we are. I'm doing it, right? Esther, you can give me a thumbs up. You're doing it. Okay, great. I'm like, we're doing it. All right. I'm always so scared of sharing like my bank statement or something, but I closed all my other tabs. All right. So, um, you know, you might have someone in your direct family who's struggling or just a loved one, or you might not have anyone that you currently know is struggling, but statistically speaking and relationally speaking, all of us know somebody who is struggling with an eating disorder. That is just the way it is. And I always say, you know, I pity the person that talks to me. This is me, here I am, uh, that talks to me on an airplane because I always 
happen to mention what I do for a living and people always have a story. So, you know, it's really easy, I think, for people to believe that it's just me or this is so hush hush or, you know, what's wrong? Why is this happening to me or my family or whatever? And again, there's no shame. Um, there's no reason to feel that stigma, even though it's super prevalent. And the more I anecdotally talk to people on airplanes and at dinner parties, I realize that this affects even more than the statistics show. I am no statistician, but I have to believe that more than 28, 29 million people have an eating disorder in the United States, just based on my my small sample size of, of people and strangers I meet on a daily basis. So excited to talk about this with you today. So at Rock Recovery, a little bit about our mission. So we're based in Arlington. We're in the Roslyn neighborhood. And we are really unique in that we actually provide direct treatment for eating disorders and co-occurring issues where the majority of our clients also have depression, anxiety, PTSD, or some other co-occurring condition. So we do provide direct therapy, both individual and group therapy. We are in network with Care First, Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield. As of the summer, I was telling Esther that my paperwork um, protocol has deeply increased and my patience has maybe decreased, but we're working on it. It's been really, it's been amazing to see how we can bridge barriers to care. Cause I'm sure, as you all know, there are a lot of people that get a lot of barriers in place that keep people from getting the treatment that they need and deserve. And cost is a big one, potentially besides stigma, I think one of the biggest ones. And so at Rock, all of our services are sliding scale, no matter someone's insurance coverage background or ability to pay. And we do also take care first insurance now as well for our services. We also do community education like this. We do support groups. We have some programs that offer faith integration. If people want to have spirituality or faith as part of their journey of recovery, we also offer that. And um, we really uniquely try to serve the whole person and care for the community. So we are out and about having all these conversations whenever and wherever we can. So here's a little bit about what we will discuss tonight. I think our brains really love stories. So I want to share a story of one of the parents I've had the joy of working with over the last 11 years. So I have been on staff now. It'll be 11 years in April. So I have been here. I was the only employee for a couple of years, and now there's six of us full-time on staff. So we're growing exponentially. But I've had the joy over my 11 years here of hearing a lot of stories and working with a lot of really amazing families. So I'll be sharing a couple of those stories with you tonight. Um, we'll talk about what is disordered eating. You'll notice that I go back and forth between the phrase disordered eating and eating disorder, not trying to confuse you. The thing is, I think in our brains, along with sort of the misconceptions and bias, we kind of all hold just because, you know, whatever things are kind of helping us form our opinions about eating disorders. But the word disordered eating captures a bit more and helps us not try to put things in a box and it covers a little bit more behaviors that can be just concerning, but not necessarily check all the boxes for diagnostic criteria that doctors are looking for, but it does kind of help catch more. So that's why we say disordered. Um, talk about the warning signs, what to look for, what treatment looks like, how you can help as a loved one, helping adolescents versus adults, because again, people of all ages and backgrounds struggle with eating disorders and disordered eating. So unfortunately it does not go away when people are no longer teenagers. Often it shows up much later in life or continues much later in life. And we know that intervention and early intervention and treatment are two of the best things we can do for early recovery. I'll share with the rest of Daniel's story and then we'll go into resources or support. And if you have questions, um, you can throw them in the chat. We'll definitely leave enough time for q and I've got about like 20 slides, but we'll go quick. Um, and I think my voice will hold on. I was saying earlier that my daughter started daycare and I got every germ that was on that place. And I've not had a voice for a month, but I think it's coming back. So um, here we are. All right. So let's jump in. So here's a quote here. Um, from Daniel, in October 2016, I was woken up by a call that every parent dreads. News from my middle daughter that his younger sister was in the middle of a deep personal crisis that had been exhausting for years, and Tara was struggling with bulimia. So this is a great example of someone with an adult child. Again, I'll also share some stories of teenagers as well. But this was a story of a man who just, you know, had three grown children and cared for them, is really engaged with them, thought they were doing well, but suddenly, sort of seemingly out of nowhere, one of his daughters was really struggling with bulimia and thankfully had sort of confided in her other sister and was sort of at a loss of what to do for help. So they called dad, which is great. It's great when children, no matter if they're 
10 or 12 or 32, call their parents for help and support or call a loved one or a trusted person for care and support because that is one of the best and first things we can do as we're on the journey to seeking help and getting care. And I think his story, it always sticks with me. We got connected by a mutual friend, actually, and really sticks with me because it was such a shock, you know, like she had been doing well, she lived in a different state. He just didn't really see it coming. And so it felt really concerning. And he felt like, you know, I had, and he actually had some resources to be able to care for her, was really engaged. They had a good relationship and he was just lost. And he was talking to one of our mutual friends one day saying, I got this call. I don't know what to do. And thankfully my friend was like, I know what to do. Talk to my friend, Christy, like she'll know what to do. So, you know, I always say not everyone has a Christy, unfortunately, and they're like, I'm so wonderful to be around, but you know, not everyone has someone that talks about this all day long. Um, so I think that's why it's so good for us to have these conversations. And I was so grateful that we were connected because it was right in that pivotal moment where you can feel really overwhelmed. You can feel really lost. And again, you're not alone and there are resources for care. So we were able to connect with him, help her find a therapist. We weren't exactly able to treat her directly, but we were able to help along that process and um, kind of get her connected to that care that she needed and help her on her way. So a great example of just doing the next right thing and helping your loved one by Really often it's connecting someone to treatment, getting them to care and kind of getting them into that next thing and having the conversation and being willing to have the hard conversations as a family or a support group. All right. So we mentioned these stats already, um, but 28 million over 20, it's like 28 to 29. It's like one of those like it keeps fluctuating year over year, have an eating disorder. And um, one in five is also estimated to have other mental health challenges. Again, I'm like, guys, have you like talked to people on the streets? Like this is like at least half of us, if not almost all of us, I feel like struggle with a mental health condition at some point in our lives. But here are the statistics that we're actually working with here. Um, but it just goes to show this affects a lot of us. And even if we don't talk about it, it's happening everywhere. It happens to people of all genders, all ages, all backgrounds, socioeconomic, race, ethnicity, everything. Like this is happening to everyone. The problem is there are some barriers in certain populations that keep people from getting the care that they need and deserve more than others, which we'll get to in a minute. But just this is a very prevalent problem. And one thing, this might seem like a strange slide to start on, but we'll talk about food a little bit. And we always talk with our clients about how eating disorders are about the food and they're not about the food. Practically, we have to eat. We need our meals. We need our snacks. We need all the sustenance and all the things. Food is everywhere. And often there are other things going on that make this illness sort of come up. So um, it's not just people wanting to be thin. It's not just certain factors. You know, there are genetic things that are at play here. There are certain life and environmental triggers, trauma, change, going to college, um, having something happen, having grief or a loss. Certain personality types, having more perfectionism can make someone a bit more prone to developing anorexia. There's lots of things that are kind of going on. But one thing that is really common that I see all the time with our clients and I see in my own story is there is this disordered relationship with food rooted in restriction at the root of almost every single eating disorder and disordered pattern that we see. Even if someone struggles more on the binge eating side or the bulimia side or other sides, there's often restriction at play that kind of sets this whole cycle into being. Um, and so this is often kind of the disordered cycle and where it begins. And a lot of it is often rooted in dieting and diet culture. So that might be a phrase that you may or may not be familiar with, the idea of diet culture. But it's really just the idea, the way I like to describe it, is the idea that thin bodies are prioritized over other types of bodies and weight loss is pursued above all else. So I can think of my own story. You know, my weight would fluctuate a little bit, a good bit here and there, a little bit here and there, depending on the on the season, what was going on with me with my disordered eating. But I remember, you know, just getting praise when I lost weight and getting all these compliments when I lost weight, but I was at my worst health. My nails were breaking. I was exhausted. I was miserable. I was anxious. I was having anxiety attacks. I was not living life. I was isolating. I mean, I was doing all these things, but I was getting all these compliments and there were all these really tough kind of things to navigate and tough things going on for me that really just felt confusing because I was not well and yet I was getting complimented. And a lot of that started with dieting. For me, a diet is what started my eating disorder. And that is the case for a lot of people we work with and a lot of things that we see. People don't mean to develop disordered eating or an eating disorder. They're just trying to do the thing of, quote unquote, being healthy or losing weight or a doctor might even tell them to do that. And often weight loss 
intentional weight loss is really dangerous and intentional dieting is really dangerous because it can really cause disordered habits and put us in this vicious cycle. So what's often happening for people is they restrict their body freaks out because our bodies are like, hey, we need food. We need to eat something. We need some sustenance. And so what happens for a lot of people is then they binge or they can kind of overcompensate. And then they sort of might feel guilty. They might sort of have a purging behavior. They might not. Um, but they'll go into the shame cycle and then it will kind of keep going, keep going, keep going. So this is often what we see happening with our clients and with disordered eating. But I like this spectrum because it helps us understand like food's complicated, bodies are complicated, life is complicated. There's not, although there are, of course, boxes we check for diagnoses, there's a lot of complicated things with disordered eating. So there are, you know, kind of on the right hand side here, the full fledged diagnosable eating disorders. We've got anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating disorder. We've got other specified feeding and eating disorders, which used to be um, EGNOS, eating disorder not otherwise specified until the most recent DSM came out. Laxative abuse, disordered body image, so all these things kind of happening on the right hand side. In the middle, there are some behaviors for those that um, practice the tradition of Lent. Ash Wednesday was what was it a week ago? We just pat, pat, um, kicked off Ash Wednesday and Lent and fasting. So fasting can be super normal and super healthy across all kinds of religious traditions and for all kinds of religious reasons. That can be something that a lot of people are able to do. I personally will never fast from food again. I fast from other things like social media. One year, my holiest Lent ever, I fasted from the alarm, um, the snooze button on my alarm. I have a baby now. I don't need an alarm or a snooze button. I don't have that luxury. But it was a very holy Lent, I like to say, when I when I gave up my, uh, my, my snooze button for Lent one year. But so fasting can be normal. And for some people, it can be really disordered and it can kind of get people on the spectrum of some dangerous behaviors. Overeating. It's perfectly normal to occasionally overeat, to, you know, eat a little bit past our level of fullness, to have a meal you enjoy a lot or to, you know be really hungry and eat quickly and be like, oops, I ate a little bit more. I'm a little bit full. Like that can be super normal. That can be okay. Um, but it can also be on this range here. Um, steroid use, probably always a disordered behavior, unless it's for like an antibiotic, for a, a sickness or an illness um, or some other medical condition. But here it's not quite all the way to a diagnosable disorder. Then we get here to the left and it's like, isn't this life? Isn't this what happens for so many of us? You know, even without eating disorders, weight and shape, preoccupation, yo-yo dieting up and down. You know, I grew up in, I was born in the 80s and so, so kind of grew up in that whole Weight Watchers craze and trend. Um, have been, I yo-yo dieted for a long, long time before kind of getting more into my eating disorder behavior. Exercising, exercising can be great. Some people can run marathons. Some people probably shouldn't based on their biology and kind of how healthy and, and much they can care for their bodies and do for, in the meantime. So lots of things here. And then all the way to the left is like the utopia of how we wish it would be for all of us. Um, and I use the word healthy here, not in the way the word healthy has been super hijacked. So it's almost like a bad word, I feel like, in our field a little bit. Healthy for someone's own stage of life, genetic makeup, um, their own weight, the health-seeking behaviors that they're able to do and want to do joyfully. Like that can mean a lot of different things for different people. We are not fans of the BMI here, the body mass index, that route recovery. That is not a good indicator of health. Um, but there is something about being in a good range for our bodies, you know, being in a good range for what we need to be at. And then movement, joyful movement and exercise, and then feeling good in our bodies. So this is kind of the continuum. So we talked a little bit here about the five major eating disorders. So anorexia, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's the one we often think of, but it is the least common eating disorder by a landslide. And um, so anorexia is restrictive behaviors, often sort of self-starvation, not eating enough to care for someone's body. There are various signs that come up as a result of this restrictive behavior. Um, often people are in smaller bodies, but one thing I always like to say is you more often cannot, more often than cannot, cannot tell someone is sick by looking at them, which that right there is like a myth busting thing. I wish we could all talk about, like, you just can't tell someone is sick by looking at them with an eating disorder. Just like you can't tell if someone has a depression or anxiety, right? We all can wear masks, but the thing is people in all shapes and sizes and all kinds of bodies have disordered eating and have eating disorders. And again, I think of my own experience being praised for weight loss. That was when I was at my worst. That was when I was at my least healthy and my least well. Um, I should have been praised when I was gaining weight and when I was actually taking care of myself. And that just wasn't because of the world we live in and the fat phobic society we live in and the diet culture we live in. 
it's hard to know what that healthy weight is for each of us individually and what it looks like for all of us. So the anorexia can affect somebody in larger bodies as well. It's often called atypical anorexia, which is kind of a dumb diagnosis, but um, it's the best we have. So people in all shapes and sizes can have eating disorders, including anorexia. Um, bulimia is often eating large quantities of food in a short period of time, and then having some kind of compensatory behavior. So having some sort of behavior like purging, we think of often vomiting, but working out a ton, taking laxatives or pills or things like that. Sorry, wrong button. Um, that can often be happening with bulimia. Um, but normally it's a binge and a purge and a compensatory behavior. And it's this cycle that kind of goes around and around. Binge eating disorder, the most recent diagnosis, according to the Diagnostic Statistic for Mental Health Disorders, and the most prevalent, the most common by far, but still the most understood, misunderstood, excuse me, and the most stigmatized because again, fat phobia and diet culture. So binge eating disorder is someone eating large quantities of food, often in short periods of time, but with no compensatory behavior, no restriction, no purging. But that alarm cycle we talked about at the beginning is still happening here. What's often still happening for people with binge eating disorder is that they're restricting during the day. They're being told you need to lose weight. So they're thinking, okay, let me go on this diet. Let me listen to this thing. So they restrict during the day to the point that they're not getting enough adequate nutrition for their body's needs. And then at night, their bodies are really, really hungry and they kind of eat large quantities of food in a short period of time. Binging is sort of, it can happen throughout the day, but often it happens at night. That's the most common time. Um, but again, it's often preceded by restriction. So the solution to lots of the different things here is not restricting and being adequately fed and nourished throughout the day and taking care of our bodies. ARFID is, um, sorry, my voice, guys, we're going to hang on, um, is avoidant restrictive food eating intake disorder. And this is one of the eating disorders that is really typically not attached to body image concerns. So all the other ones might be attached to body image concerns. People might be trying to lose weight. They might be trying to diet. They might be concerned with their weight and shape. It's not true for everybody. Sometimes it is trauma and coping or genetics or other things kind of happening with habituated behavior. But for ARFID, it's normally about a fear of a food. So it's a texture thing. It can be someone's afraid of a texture. They had a bad experience choking, so they're scared of choking. They try to keep kind of a bland diet and they have a very limited number of safe foods, but it's not based on weight or shape concerns. It's based on a fear of a certain food, often showing up in younger kids. Um, and often for people who are neurodiverse, this can be something that affects them a little bit more frequently. And just also happens um, through all stages, but those are kind of the things we're seeing. And then other specified feeding and eating disorders, the really jargony mouthful one to say, um, OSFED. So this is for people that wouldn't hit the criteria boxes for other ones, but show significant either distress with food, distress with their bodies, um, periods of binging or purging, but not quite enough to hit the diagnostic criteria, or they might be in a different, in a certain weight body that does not hit criteria for some of the other eating disorders, but it's just here to capture some significant behaviors going on as well. So what are the warning signs? So um, there's lots to look for emotionally, behaviorally, and physically. So like I said, you can't always tell from looking at somebody if they're struggling and there are some signs to look for. Um, but emotional, you might notice that people are sort of isolating more. Um, they're spending more time alone. They might be withdrawing. They might be um, kind of just grumpy. And kind of, and you know, with teens, it's like, how do I know? Like, what's going on? Lots of changes. Stress can be hard on all of us. Like, what's going on here? But these are more notable signs and changes and behaviors and shifts. And definitely one of the big things is withdrawing. So not really spending time with friends or family, wanting to eat alone, wanting to be alone, wanting to have some space in a, in a, in a way that's new or not necessarily the healthy norm for this individual. Um, nothing against, you know, introverts, right? Of course, there's some great alone time things, but withdraw, withdrawing is different than, and isolating is different than just wanting to get some alone time. So you might notice other behaviors and things like they're starting to notice. So this is especially for, you might know this is in teens, but also adults, preoccupation with what someone's eating, what other people are eating, noticing what's on someone else's plate, how much, how many calories are in a food, weighing themselves a lot, paying a lot of attention to certain things, counting certain things. And um, those are big signs to look for. Being uncomfortable eating around other people, wanting to eat alone more often, 
dieting, cutting out certain food groups. Of course, there are times when there are true allergies or medical conditions that people need to make dietary modifications for. But so often those things have been hijacked again by the word quote unquote healthy. And people are doing all these restrictive behaviors that aren't actually healthy or good for them and can trigger and cause a lot of this disordered behaviors. And then a lot of kind of psychosomatic results. So if what's really wild about our bodies, if we believe a certain food is bad and we believe it in our brain, sometimes when we eat that food, we'll feel bad. Like sometimes we can actually cause ourselves to have certain responses around foods because of our beliefs about the food. It's pretty wild. Um, so just kind of paying attention to some of these things happening with people and how they're handling food. Um, comments about food and body, fluctuating weight. So again, all shapes and sizes are affected by eating disorders. And if you notice, mostly with weight loss, that might be a sign and, you know, large fluctuations that are often happening up and down, not related to other kind of normal things happening in someone's life, like puberty, growth, et cetera, um, pregnancy, weight gain, all the other things, aging. Um, but if you notice fluctuations that seem extreme and seem recurrent, those are can be signs to look for. Menstrual irregularities for those missing periods or um, only having them forced with certain contraceptives. Um, that can be a thing to look for as well. But basically, changes in body. There are some other ones that are a bit more extreme. Fainting. Sleep issues. Dental problems. Dentists can often see... Um, bulimia first and even binge eating with the increase in saliva or the decrease in saliva from various things. So dentists can really notice a lot of these different things happening. Dry skin and hair, um, growing fine hair on the body, being exhausted and being weak, um, cold hands all the time or purple hands, and then not healing well and getting sick a lot. So kind of noticing some of these physical signs. This is when people are kind of experiencing more extreme disordered behavior, some things to look for as well. So what's your role as a loved one? So we went through some of the basics here, kind of where eaters are coming from, what's causing them. Body image is often kind of at play for people concerned with weight, shape, and size, um, control and coping, all these different variables, changes in schools, changes in life, all these things can be kind of happening. So what are your roles as loved ones, whether it be parents or whether it be um, friends and family? So you know, this is literally my job and I have friends who have eating disorders and develop eating disorders. And even I sometimes like, don't like feel nervous, feel nervous talking to them, feel nervous knowing what to say, feel nervous having the conversation, because this is a really vulnerable and deep thing that someone is experiencing a good bit of pain and they need support from loved ones. And it can be really tough, but saying something and supporting somebody is critical to kind of bring things to the light and just to really care for those who are struggling. Um, it's just such a really beautiful thing to see. And I know for me in my early journey, when I was seeking recovery, some of my friends, I was young, I was like 22 when I saw recovery, but it's been what, 20 years. So some of my friends didn't know what to say, um, but they did their best. And did we muddle through it? Sure. But like just knowing that I wasn't alone and I had that support, and going to a few trusted friends was huge for me, knowing who to draw boundaries from when I needed certain boundaries sent from people, having my family support who helped pay for all my treatment um, therapy appointments because I was not making a lot of money as a 22-year-old, not able to afford therapy at the time. So thankfully, I had the support of my parents. That's what really got me into this work at Rock Recovery. We think that anyone who needs care should be able to access it. So I um, want to be able to remove those barriers for people. But here are some of the things you can do regardless of your role. Talk to your loved one get them connected to care, get them to a therapist, get them to a next right step to get them with an expert. Um, educate yourself, understand a bit more, try to learn about your own bias and the things you need to learn. Find support for yourself and the whole like oxygen mask principle, right? Like put your own mask on first before caring for somebody else. Um, it's really critical. And then continuing to check in with yourself and with your loved one and with your community support. So talking to your loved one, um, being present and listening and taking a whole person and a person first approach is critical. It is so hard when someone we love is struggling with something because it affects us, right? And we care for them and we want what's best for them. So it can be just terrifying to kind of be going through this. But the good news is people do get better and with support recovery is possible. So this is just parts of the journey and parts of the steps, right? But being present and being grounded is really helpful. So doing what you need to do to have a conversation and calm yourself, practicing, writing it down, scheduling it, whatever it is, um, listening, you know, it's, this is the hardest, I would say, um, hardest about lots of different things, but 
you know what you think. I feel like it's so, gosh, I would love to like fix my friends and family to death, like to like out of love, right? It's like, oh, I know what you need. Let me tell you what you should do. Um, But really what we should do is listen, right? That's such an important step is being able to care for our loved ones, listening and holding space for them. It doesn't mean not holding them accountable and letting them, you know, spin or being stuck or being in denial, but like truly listening and caring and getting to the root with someone is so powerful. And just making sure you take a first, a person first approach, letting them know this comes from love. Like I care about you. I'm, this isn't about your eating or your running or whatever. Like I just love you and I care about you and I'm here for you. And I just see you coping in some ways that are concerning me. And I know you're going through a lot. So I want to just be here for you. How can I help you? What can we do? Like, do you want to talk? Like that's kind of one of the best ways to really start these conversations. Um, and we can't talk about talking to loved ones without talking about food. Um, I, I always thought this cupcake looks really good, but now I'm realizing I'm like, oh, I might go for a chocolate instead of this one. It looks a little fruity, but it's like really blown up on my computer. Um, but I do love this picture. But, you know, we have to talk about food, even though, again, eating disorders aren't about the food. Food shows up in our lives. It is it is exhibiting around the food. Like I remember when I had my eating disorder, this picture of a cupcake would honestly probably make me feel fear. Like, and if that's where you're coming from today, that's totally okay. Like it can be a really normal step in the process that food can feel scary because we can feel either totally out of control around food or food might be the thing that we use to feel in control and safe or some combination of the above. But food can be really scary. And I often talk about our clients. So at Rock Recovery, we do group meal support programs, therapy programs, where we come together as a group with a therapist. We have a shared meal. We talk about the feelings that come up over the meal. We process things from the day. We process our hunger fullness scale. How hungry are we? How full are we? How are we feeling? What is this food bringing up for us? We have a chat. We go into a therapy directive and we kind of close our mealing together. And I mean, people cry, right? Like it is very normal in our beautiful little office in Roslyn that people are in tears over pasta or over a hamburger or over whatever it might be. Cause it's scary. It is really scary to give up this thing that can make us feel safe. I talk all the time about for me, you know, my eating disorder really felt like a binky, you know, like your little lovey that you have and you just like want to hold on to and it makes you feel safe. Of course it's maladaptive. Of course it's not helping us be well or be whole or get us where we need to get. But there's a reason we turn to the disordered eating behavior. There's a reason these things develop. One, the way our bodies and biochemistry can work, but two, to feel safe, to feel in control, to feel better, to not feel, to numb out, to whatever the thing is, there's something going on because life is really hard and life is really messy. And so for those of us that struggle with food, um, food can be really scary. It can be really scary. The beautiful thing is, you know, for me now, I actually really love food. It's, I cannot, when you, if you would have told me when I went through recovery 20, 19 years ago, um, I would not have believed you that I would be someone that could keep certain foods in my house and not think about them. My husband and I always joke, like I'll buy ice cream and I'll like go to eat it and it's gone. And I'm like, you ate all the ice cream. And he's like, it was there for a month. And I'm like, oh, I just forgot about it. I just didn't want it. I had something else or I just didn't want it until right now. And I just kind of forgot about it, but I never would have believed I could have all foods around, eat every food that I wanted, eat the hamburgers, eat the salads, eat the cupcakes, eat whatever. Like I just, I just didn't believe it because I felt so scared and like I had to control it and I had to have all these lists of I can't do this and I can only do this and this is what will keep me safe. And it's just so wild to see that that's not the case because food is great. Breaking bread together. Um, we have our annual gala in two weeks for our 15th anniversary. And we call it our breaking bread gala because like the beauty of our work is that it happens around the table and we help people get better at our table so they can come home to yours. They can come home to their loved one's table and get well there and maintain their health there because breaking bread is such a beautiful, huge part of life. Okay. That's my little soapbox about food. We can move on. I know you was with that cupcake for a long time. Um, so here's the thing. I think we have to talk about food. And again, we all can have our own beliefs. And I think food and nutrition is really personal. Um, there are certain ways culturally and value-wise that we grow up with that can be really unique and really important to maintain our individuality. And I think oftentimes us labeling food as good and bad can be really dangerous and be really damaging to ourselves and our loved ones and our kids. So um, 
we have this little slide here where it's like good food, apples, avocados, sushi, and also good food, cupcakes, broccoli, salads, cheese, like all of these foods are good. And not all of you might not agree with me for making the statement. And that's okay. That's okay. This is the stance we take at Rock. Um, we believe in a thing called intuitive eating. There's these 10 principles I'll talk about briefly. But um, the idea, one of the big core principles is that um, all foods fit. That's kind of like the battle cry of intuitive eating. All foods fit. Variety, balance, and moderation is kind of that next battle cry of like, we can eat all the things and we want to have a nice balanced diet where we're caring for ourselves. We're eating cupcakes. We're eating the kale. We're eating things we enjoy and that we're caring and nourishing our bodies. We're moving well, um, but we're not feeling ashamed for certain foods because how often does someone say, oh, my diet starts tomorrow or, oh, I shouldn't have eat this or, oh, I'm so bad for eating this thing and kids are listening and people are listening and those shameful comments, they're just not true. You are no worse for eating a cookie and no better for eating a salad. That's just not, there's no morality to this food. There's really not. Um, and we need to care for ourselves and our own individual bodies, but removing this morality around food is so core in the healing process of an eating disorder. And just for, I think, general well-being and health and, and flexibility, you know, I it's amazing to me that so often I actually want a salad, whereas for years I made myself eat them. And now I'm like, oh my gosh, I actually want to choose this because I've kind of taken away the power from food and the fear around food. I can listen to my body. I know when I want the hamburger versus something else. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing to get back to that trust we can have in our bodies um, and to care for our bodies in that way. But it can be really hard to kind of get over these messages we're getting from diet culture and the diet industry and all these things as well it can be really, really tricky. Um, but this is all good food and we want to get to the place that we can listen to our bodies, honor our hunger, honor our fullness, kind of reject these certain things that aren't serving us and really and really care for ourselves. So that's our little soapbox about food here. Um, we're we're getting we're getting close-ish to the end for those who are kind of keeping track. Um, getting connected to care. So for yourself and for your loved ones, in addition to being aware of how we're talking about food, how we're talking about our own bodies, the comments we're making, the foods we're serving, the things that we're doing, um, helping people see an expert. Like I said at the beginning, I am not a therapist. I have no fancy letters behind my name. I'm very sad about it, but it's okay. But we really do need these experts. We need support groups and peers and people like myself who can help. And we need the people who are who are trained in treating this and trained in supporting people and getting them well. And I will say, as it relates to therapy and dietitians in particular, um, getting people, if you're struggling with disordered eating or eating disorders, getting someone who actually is trained in eating disorders is critical because this is not um, a super intuitive illness to treat. And it requires someone who really knows what they're doing who could, or else people can really do more harm than good, even with really great intentions. So finding experts, we've got a great list on the Rock, Rock Recovery's website, which is just rockrecoveryed.org. I'll mention it again at the end, rockrecoveryed.org. We've got a list of referrals in our area, support groups, our treatment groups at Rock. We've got lots of things that we can connect you to there. We can help connect you out in the community, but um, work with NAMI as well. There's so many great referrals we can work with um, that requires doing research, which can be overwhelming, which is why we're all here to help you. NAMI and ourselves at Rock Recovery, all here to help um, because it can require a lot of us to be doing this work. But we need a treatment team. So for someone with an eating disorder, they need a therapist, dietitian, primary care physician, um, often a support group, um, often a psychiatrist. If someone needs medication, that can be a great great tool and thing that people might need temporarily or for life as part of their treatment as well, which is great. So also, also a psychiatrist might be a part of, of the team as well. Um, and just don't do this alone. Again, we're here to help you. If it can feel really overwhelming, but there are lots of great resources. Um, we'll go over one more at the end. Our friends at the Alliance for Eating Disorders there in Florida have an awesome website. Um, there's just so many great, great, great resources here. All right, so educate yourself on the issue. Um, so here you are, you're, you're step one, you did it. You can check something off your list, you guys. I'm very proud of you. Um, but finding a community of people who are like-minded and just are kind of doing the work and the research is really helpful to know we're not alone. At Rock, we always call this the gift of I get it. I remember the first support group I ever went to, I was like kind of grumpy in the corner really quietly. And I was like, I'm not going to say a word at this group. I'm just going to sit here. And then someone across the room made a comment and said something that they'd been thinking that 
I had thought a million times and thought for sure I was the only person who had this horrible thought, this such a shameful thought. And I just remember being like, oh my gosh, it's not just me. I'm not alone. Like that just broke something in me in a good way that just took away the shame and the stigma because again, we're not alone. We're not alone. Um, there are lots of great resources to get educated. There are lots of great trainings like this one um, that you can do. And we have a lot of other free trainings on, on Rock's website or other places as well. But just continuing to educate yourself, reading books um, can be a huge, huge next step. Getting support for you. So if you're supporting a loved one who is struggling with this, whether it be child's partner, friend, um, it's good to have a therapist. I have been in therapy now for, I guess, almost 20 years. Um, I'll be in therapy forever. At one point, I think I had three therapists. There's like a couples therapist, an EMDR therapist, um, and then I got my regular therapist. And I was like, three is enough. Three is for sure enough. Maybe I'll stick with one, maybe sometimes two. But it's just so good to be getting treatment and to be getting support for yourself no matter what you're going through, no matter what season you're going through, it is such an important thing just to keep up those tune-ups. Um, you know, I'm, I've been recovered for a long time, but I'm still a human and life is still hard. So I will see a therapist forever. Um, it is expensive. It is certainly a privilege and a luxury that I have, which is why, again, at Rock, we remove that barrier for people. But something I really recommend. Um Taking time to rest and reflect, not just numb out. You know, it's okay to watch the Netflix sometimes and do all the things, but truly doing life-giving rest and things that care for you is really critical in these hard seasons. Um, and staying grounded in your own spiritual practices, prayer, meditation, whatever it might be, going on walks, just staying grounded and caring for yourself is is really huge. Um, sleeping, drinking water, all these things. Um, and then continuing to check in. If your child's under 18, it's a pretty intensive process on the family. <clears throat> what most providers do is work with something called family-based treatment, FBT. And it's intensive. It's the family and the parents really driving the process, eating a lot of meals together or all of the meals together with the child. Um, it's the gold standard for treatment. It is really hard, but it is really, for many people, really wonderful if it works for the family. There are other methods as well, but staying connected to the team is critical to make sure communication's open. Everyone kind of has what they need to have and everyone is on the in the in the loop on what's going on. Can I think of the family? So my sister actually also struggled with an eating disorder well before I did. We were actually, I guess I was in middle school, she was in high school. And at the time it was a long time ago. I remember my my parents went with my sister to, to therapy and never involved me. And I think they were trying to support me, protect me. I was young, you know, which is totally fair. Like, I think they made a good choice at the time with what they knew and what research showed. Um, but looking back, I remember just like sitting at home, I guess I had a babysitter. I wasn't like alone, alone, but I remember just sitting at home being like, okay, well, my whole family went to talk to this person about this thing that we don't really talk about. And like, I'm just going to sit here and not talk about it. And I think my parents did talk to me a little bit, right? They included me a little bit, but um, both on the issue, it's really important to be transparent and open with the family, with the other siblings, with other people. It can be hard and it can feel weird, especially depending on kids' ages. You want to do it appropriately, um, but it's good. Transparency is always good. It's always good to kind of have some of those conversations. And um, eventually, my sister and I have talked quite a bit about this and my family, my parents are like my biggest supporters and cheerleaders now. They're wonderful. Um they're truly, truly wonderful, but you know, no one's perfect and we're all learning. And so I think now we might do it a little bit differently, but staying connected both on the hard and on the good. Um, so beyond eating meals together and mealtime might be very stressful for a while and that's okay. It won't always be that way. Um, but doing things as a family, going to movies, uh, going to sporting events, game nights, whatever the things are that you guys enjoy as a family, like doing fun stuff together and staying connected at varying ages for the kids is really, really helpful just to kind of keep that glue together. Um, and then staying connected to other loved ones as well. So having check-ins for you um, is really important and being able, so you can care for your loved one without feeling depleted and overwhelmed as well. And knowing that it's okay if you're human, it's okay if you're struggling, it's okay if something's going on with you, like that's okay. We don't need to be perfect. Um, but just wanting to be, to be safe and supported. All right. Well, what we're landing the plane here. So we'll have plenty of time for Q and a, um, so if your child's an adolescent 
it's important to remember that your core part of the treatment process, even if your child or teen is telling you, leave me alone, you can't, you can't. Um, your role is to be an advocate for your child. And it really can be helpful for some people to separate the eating disorder from the person. And remember, this isn't your child, this isn't your loved one, right? This is something they're struggling with that is manifesting in a lot of behavior, but it's it's not them, it's not them, and they can be well again. Um, Finding support is crucial and asking it for it and asking for help. You don't have to do it all yourself. And then recovery, recovery isn't linear. Take it one day at a time. I always talk about just doing the next right thing. And like, it is such a tough, such a tough lesson. Cause for me, I remember when I first realized I had an eating disorder, I would struggled from about 13 to 22 before I sought treatment and I was kind of tricked into treatment. And I went to um, this church that happened to be running a support group. And I was tricked into going to that church. I was not a person of faith at the time. And I was not terribly interested in the support group, but I kind of stumbled my way into it and it totally changed my life. And, you know, here we are today. So it worked, <laughs> thankfully. But I remember at the support group, it's called New ID. It's actually a group we now run. Um, we do it virtually. I start running it in March. It's on Mondays in March, if you want to look it up. It's six weeks long. And it's one of our faith-based groups for those who do want to integrate faith. Um, but I remember just sitting there and being like, okay, six weeks. Sure. By the end of this group, six weeks is a long time, but I guess I'll try it. And the very first night of New ID, the woman's like, you won't be better in six weeks. Like This is going to be a journey. And I was like, can I leave? Like, would that be rude? Um, it's a journey. It's a lot of baby steps, but just like anything we struggle with in life, right? The little steps add up and each step you take is one step further to where you want to be. And um, even though recovery was hard, it required a lot of tears and a lot of really tough things for me. It also did bring a lot of discovery, a lot of maturity, a lot of growth and a lot of redemption. I think for me, I look back and I see now, a lot of the hard things that led to it and happened through it. And, you know, I don't, it, I wouldn't wish it on anybody, obviously. Um, and I do see some redemption and um, it's hard to say I'm grateful for it, but I really do see the fruit from it now. And I love my work and I love these people we get to serve. And um, I love that I have a good relationship with food and, you know, I love that I hang out with therapists all day. So there are these beautiful re redeeming things that do come along the way. Um, and just not being freaked out when you have a bad day because it will happen. It's okay. Like it's not linear. It's two steps forward, one step back, and that's okay. Um, so taking it one day at a time is really, really helpful. Um, if your child's an adult, if you have a grown-up child, um, they're the driver of their recovery. It is, you can support and you can help and you can do all the boundaries you need to do. And, you know, legally they're in charge. Um you can respect the boundaries they set lovingly and set your own boundaries and also let people know what you think you need and you can share your opinions um, and you can share your beliefs and you can you can really share your concern lovingly as well. Um, so this can be really tough because if someone's not well, they might not be setting the best of boundaries, but this is where community, other loved ones and that treatment team can come into play and just really encouraging people to get help. And healing takes time again, not linear, linear. And the best thing you can do is offer love and support and a person first approach, the care support. We talk a lot too, if you're worried about somebody and they're in denial, um, this is one of those things with any mental health concern where, you know, if someone had cancer, you'd be like, wouldn't you go to the best specialist? Wouldn't you take time off work? Wouldn't you tell your friends? Wouldn't you get the meal train or whatever thing you're going to do? Like, this should be no different. This should be no different. Struggling with an eating disorder, any kind of mental health concern or illness like this, this should be no different than if we have cancer or have some other kind of physical ailment because this is a physical physical illness, right? And a mental illness. And so um, offering love and support and helping to reframe it for people that you're just there from them and helping to remove the shame can be a really, really huge piece. So here's the end of Daniel's story. Um, He's now one of our lovely partners. He gives me all kinds of business advice and we've become dear friends, but um, he's been working with us here at Rock for a while. And we really did help get them connected. I think for his daughter, um, she also struggled with um, substance use and alcohol. So for her getting sober, getting free from her disordered eating and um, 
sort of getting through the other pieces were huge for her. Oftentimes people have those co-occurring conditions as well with disordered eating. Um, but she now is doing great. She's living this life. She's super happy in a great relationship, has a job that she loved. And, you know, she has this full, lovely life. And we just started at Rock our first ever teen program. So we only serve high schoolers for our group therapy and we, um, and for our individual therapy, we'll go a little bit younger into middle school, but we do individual and group therapy for teens. And we started our first teen group a little over a year ago. We served adults primarily before that, but we small nonprofit working to grow, expanding. And we have now run five cohorts of our teen bridge to life body image therapy group. And I get to come in and talk to the teens at the end of each eight week cohort where like it brings back all my awkward eighth grade anxieties, but like we get there every time. Um, and it's just amazing to see how brave these people are and how hard they're working and how wonderful and loving their families are and how everyone's just muddling through it and doing it beautifully all at the same time. And we really do see a lot of progress in those eight weeks with our clients and just see people kind of come back to life and they get to support each other and have their peer support, which is so beautiful and powerful. And it's just been one of my favorite things we've ever done. And so we're serving both adult kids and teen kids and grownups all around. But there's just lots of really beautiful stories. As much as there are stories of the struggle, there are stories of the overcoming as well. Um, so Rock Recovery, that's us, that's me. So our website is rockrecoveryed.org. Um, we have all kinds of therapy services, support groups, blogs, webinars, all kinds of fun things on our website. Um, the Alliance for Eating Disorders Awareness. So if you just Google, I'm sorry, I don't have the website links here, but if you just Google the Alliance for Eating Disorders Awareness, they've got a great find ED help guide and there's some of our, and they've got amazing friends and family support groups and just general support groups all the time. The National Eating Disorder Association has some toolkits. Um, there are some good books if you want a faith, faithy book. Um, Nearsighted is a good one. There's great for spouses and romantic partners. Um, Dr. Dana Heron, who's one of our founding volunteers, wrote this great book, Loving Someone with an Eating Disorder. And then um, a book called The Eating Disorder Trap. There's a lot of other great book resources for um, families and teens as well. Carolyn Costin has some great books. We could email out maybe some resources since I don't have the links here, if that'd be okay. Or I can put them in the chat in a minute when we're doing q and I'll put them in the chat at the very least. Um, but there's some great resources there that you guys can link to. And then um, here's our lovely, part of our lovely team. Um, our phone number, our email, um, and would love to hear from you. So in my email is just Christy at rockrecoveryed.org. So if you just put my name, it's spelled here. And then that, you're welcome to shoot me an email. Happy to work with you individually. Um, but then we can move along and, and do some questions and I can stop sharing my screen. Thanks everybody. Wow. My goodness. Um, first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I am the mom of three girls. And being the mom of three girls, there, I have a swimmer, a cheerleader, a basketball player. We, I hear this. I hear so often. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm. I have to be in a bathing suit. I have to be in this small little costume. Um. It's so prevalent, especially with social media. Um, the pressure is, and while I know absolutely that it's not just pressure, um, we hear it so much because of the unreality of social media. Um, it's not helpful. It's not helpful as parents. Um, it's not helpful in in the mental health world um, as we're fighting back different stigmas associated with people that already, already need help. Um, so this was fantastic information um, and it really validating if you've been involved in any other NAMI programs, um, you know, we talk about community, we talk about in support groups, um, peers being with peers, family members understanding, you might hear my dog, I'm working from home right now, sorry about that. Um, you, we talk about um, understanding, getting that understanding that you're not alone. Um, 
so talk to me, uh, you know, we had a question in the chat and I want to get to that first before we open it up a little bit more. Uh, intermittent fasting. Um, we see that all the time as being something it's beneficial, it's helpful. Um, how quickly have you seen intermittent fasting, intermittent fasting, I need to work on that one, um, change to too much? How can that, you know, what does that look like for you? Oh man. Yeah, I know there, it, it looks, it's a thing. It's definitely a thing, right? I feel like, again, some people like for religious reasons, going can fast in certain ways, but intermittent fasting is such a different thing. Cause the problem with intermittent fasting from my perspective, and I, and again, I know, I think what is hard, I like to always say this food can feel very personal. Um, and how we eat is really personal. And so I do understand that we're all coming from different perspectives here, but I am speaking from the eating disorder lens. So just take that with a grain of salt. Um, my husband always jokes, I'm really a hit at dinner parties and people like make comments. I'm like, actually, <laughs> you know, let me, let me tell you. Um, Tori though, my husband says the same thing. We should go to dinners together then, Rebecca, me and you. Oh, we'd be, we'd be great. We'll be, <laughs> we'd be yeah, great. You, just, just you and I will be great. <laughs> exactly. We'll do that. We'll do that for sure. Um, but I think the problem with intermittent fasting, for me, first and foremost, is you are fighting against all the cues your body is giving you. So generally, when your body is giving you cues of hunger, like we should listen. Um, and intermittent fasting is really working against that. So when I talk about intuitive eating, which is something that we really value at Rock Recovery, it's the idea of reclaiming that listening to your body. Like when your baby cries for food, like you feed them, right? Like with, there are these cues that we have early on and that they're honored. And then as we get older, we're it's kind of taught to us because of diet culture and because of all the things and the fat phobia in the world and all the rest. Um, it's, it's kind of taught to us to like, no, your body should be feared. Food should be feared. All these things should be feared. And it's just not true. And that just puts us in a more perpetual cycle of disordered eating. So the biggest problem for me of intermittent fasting is you're not listening to your body and your body needs to eat and you need to be wet, well fed and you need to kind of be stabilized with what you're eating. And then often if you're restricting and not eating enough, again, that can cause those cycles of binging, which we talked about earlier as well. And I think the biggest thing else is where I get so mad. Um, People feel like they're the problem. Like, oh, I have no willpower. Oh, what's wrong with me? Oh, why can't I keep this diet? Oh, why can't I keep this fast? It's because you shouldn't. It's because it's not good for you. It's because your body's trying to help you. Um, it's because you need to care for your body. And when it's hungry, feed it and give it and give it food and sustenance. Um, so I think the most interesting thing is because it's getting us to not listen to those cues and our bodies are smart. Our bodies are really smart. And of course there's things we need to, you know, take care of ourselves and learn certain things and like sleep. And there's lots of different hygiene things we need to do beyond just eating, but um, like sleep hygiene and drink the water and all the things and not having too much caffeine. But like, yeah, it's really important to listen to our bodies when they're hungry, you guys. So that's my thought there. Here's one. Um, we hear now all of these wonderful, I'm, that was in quotes, um, amazing and life-changing um, diet drugs with the shots and Ozempic and Monjaro and all of these things. Um, it's going to, you know, diabetics aren't able to get them because they're getting prescribed in other ways and there's shortages. What, what do you see um, this doing to people and disordered eating? I, yeah, I can just imagine I'm because it I seems mean, like a magic bullet and I think Ozempic and all these drugs, I mean, I think they're scary because people, first of all, people need them who have true medical conditions, like people need them. And that's scary. People can't get their medication. Um, I had a baby when the infant, the formula shortage happened, which is much like the smallest, like it's not at all the same scale. I feel as a medication like diabetes, but like it's scary when you can't access what you need um, for other reasons, right? And I think we don't know what the long-term toll of taking those drugs is going to do to people who don't actually medically need them. Um, bone loss, malnutrition, like there are going to be a lot of things that happen for people who are, who are restricting because of it. And they might check the box of weight loss and get applauded at the doctor's appointment, but their health will not 
be better, I think, in my opinion. Um, you know, sometimes there are times that our body weight might change if we change some health seeking behaviors that are good and sustainable and life giving for us. Um, but weight loss for the sake of weight loss is really dangerous and scary. Um, and I think it it just means you have to be on it forever. And that's just not sustainable for lots of people. It's really expensive and not everyone's insurance covers it. That also has its own privilege. And a lot of bodies don't need to lose weight. A lot of bodies are okay. Uh, I can speak from experience of people that I've worked with. And, um, you know, some of people's BMI ranges are in the obese factor, the obese thing, but their labs are excellent. Their blood pressure is excellent. Their health is excellent. Like they are in excellent health. Um, whereas someone else who's like, has a great quote unquote BMI in a smaller body can have really bad labs and really bad other things, but doctors aren't necessarily checking or prescribing the same things because of some of the stigma and this own bias, even in the medical community. I hate to be down on doctors guys, but there are some bad ones and there are some great ones, but yeah. um, this obsession with weight is just missing the mark when it comes to health is what I would say. To that. Are, are you like me? You see, you see some, whether it's athletes or other people, in my case, it's the strong women. It's the women that I, I used to be a professional ballet dancer and I see the Misty Copelands come out, these strong athletic women. And it's just such a, it's wonderful to see because gone are the days of, you know, five foot nine, 110 pounds and being forced to be that. Um, it's the strong athletic woman that we're celebrating. Um, and I hope that celebration keeps continuing. It keeps moving forward. Um, I want to, before I, I, I should have thanked you um, right from the start for sharing, being vulnerable and sharing your own story. Um, you know, it, that takes, uh, it takes a lot. It's no matter how many times you say it, um, sharing your own personal journey and going through your own recovery is, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot for a leader and it's a lot for any person to share. So I want to thank you for that. Um, we, you can see in the chat that anytime you share a story, um, it matters to people. Um, and so thank you for that. Um, there's a question in the chat for AR, ARFID with no hunger cue. Is it possible to eat intuitively? Thank you for that, Rebecca. I really appreciate it. Um, and as a ballerina too, we have to go to dinner parties together. Oh we really will be. <laughs> and I love Misty Copeland. Um, so that's a great point. So with ARFID, um, that's the Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder for the acronyms of Washington, D.C. over here. Um, intuitive eating will look different for each individual. And based on some individuals kind of... Um, uniqueness. I think not everyone can do intuitive eating, quote unquote, by the book. So there's 10 principles of intuitive eating and some people, those won't work. So it's not a one size fits all. It is the best thing I think like we have that is broad, but working with a dietitian and a therapist who specializes in ARFID can be really helpful to help someone understand how to get back to eating again, because intuitive eating is often a solution to diet culture. Um, and ARFID isn't often rooted in a fear of a certain weight or shape. It's more based on other feared foods, textures, like there's other things often going on. It is one diagnosis that can be a little bit trickier with intuitive eating. So that will just look different for somebody um, who is working to recover from ARFID. But we often also use the word kind of food freedom or flexibility. And for Rock Recovery, our mission statement is to support the journey to freedom from disordered eating. And it really is a journey and it looks different for everybody. So I appreciate the question because it is not, I don't have a super clean answer. Um, because it's kind of like kind of is my answer, I think. Because it, it's just it's individualized and it that's why it's really good to work with that treatment team and why it will look a little bit different. But also I should state as well, um, people with anorexia, really anybody, I mean, struggling with an eating disorder is not ready to do intuitive eating tomorrow. So intuitive eating, if you're struggling with an eating disorder or your loved one is, isn't something you can just start tomorrow. Cause a lot of people don't have hunger fullness cues. And one of the principles is honoring your hunger, hunger fullness cues. And it's like, well, I don't have any. So what do I do? Right. So there's often pre-work to be done before someone can do intuitive eating. And for some people, 
that might not be how their bodies and their brains work. And that's okay. So they'll have a different plan in place. They'll have a different kind of meal plan. They'll make a different schedule. They'll, they'll have a different sort of plan of what that freedom can look like for them based on those unique needs. But great question. I'm going to go back to what I said at the beginning around co-occurring disorders, because that's something, you know, when, when often when we at NAMI talk about co-occurring disorders, we talk about substance use disorder. It's mental illness and, I mean, that's what we do. Um, it was really interesting to me as I prepared for, it prepared for this, but I'll be honest, my, um, my very best friend in the world, her daughter, freshman, freshman year in college, uh, came home and had to go into a hospital for a while with uh, disordered eating. It came out, at, like you said, seemed to have come out of nowhere, but it was the pressure of being a freshman in college. And I started doing a lot more research myself. Um, you know, I helped her get into a support group because where she lives, um, because she needed it. But then just doing more research myself, um, I was surprised at that number, just how the co-occurring, and I shouldn't be surprised because logically it makes so much sense. Um, what do you see? A great question and great points all around. I mean, I think we see our client, I mean, our clients are the best. We see the best people. I will say that. Um, maybe I'm biased, but I just love the people we get to serve. So I see the best people. And we see a lot of complexity and a lot of complex cases of people, right? And I think, um, again, you check the boxes, you think of like diagnostic things you have to hit, like people are not so simple. Um, we see a lot of anxiety and depression. I mean, truly, I think virtually all of our clients, I'm thinking of like our the boring paperwork I do. I'm like, what have I seen? Um, I think almost all of them have a co-occurring anxiety, depression diagnosis, um, often adjustment disorder, some PTSD and some trauma. So we are seeing a lot of co-occurring things. We're seeing a little bit more with substance use recently in our clients. Um, and so we certainly see all kinds of different complexities and we see all kinds of different things that cause it to start. Like to your point, going to college, um, big changes, stress, going on a diet, losing a loved one. Like you just, everyone's story really is so unique. And there often are a lot of, I guess, shared narratives as well. Like everyone's individual and unique and there are some patterns and some trends. Um, so I think we're just, we're just seeing a lot. We serve primarily girls and women, uh, female identifying clients are the majority of who we serve. Um, but people of all genders definitely struggle. So we're seeing a bit more men and people identify as men seeking help, um, which has been good. I would like to, I mean, I love being with the ladies, but it's been, it's been nice to have a little bit more people there. Um, our whole staff are, we're all, we're all women. So that's, you know, has its, I actually, I have, I'm not sure it's had its challenges yet. I'm sure there are some I don't know about, but it's been great. Um, but we know that people of all gender struggle. So we want to re represent that as well and, and be aware of that. So we see, I don't know if that answered your question, Rebecca, but we see, we see, we see a lot of stuff, we see all kinds of things. Um, we have two in the, two in the chat I want to talk about. I work with teens that often feel they may be struggling with an eating disorder, but will automatically go to anorexia. What questions are appropriate to ask to explore if someone is struggling with an ED? That's a great question. Um, and a hard one. Way to ask a specific hard question. Let me think about that for a <laughs> second. Um, it is, and it's so interesting. Again, anorexia is the least common eating disorder. So isn't it interesting that that's what people go to? I think it's still the most well-known though, right? Like I think if you pulled and pulled someone off the street, that's the one they would know. And it, I think it's partially media, partially celebrities, partially like the things we have in our brain, but it's, it, I don't think you're alone in that. And I just think it's still so interesting. We have a lot more work to do. Um, I think being curious. So I'm thinking about one of those slides I shared about sort of the signs to look for. So being curious and asking somebody like, okay, like, have you been eating differently than you used to eat? Like, tell me about like, are there certain foods you're trying to avoid? Um, tell me about what a meal might look like for you. Tell me about how you eat most of your meals. Like, are they alone? Are they with other people? Um, 
thoughts are honestly one of them. Like we do this thing in one of our support groups where you like get a little pie chart and you think about where your thought energy goes all day long and you kind of like write down and categorize it. And I remember when I like, I did this thing when I was going through treatment and it was, I mean, it was something like 45% of my thought life in a day went towards calories, working out, food, whatever, like, like what seeing it was pretty convicting. Cause I was like, I have stuff to do, man. Like that's how much of my time is going to this, but, um, so kind of asking questions about like their thought life, um, is it, you know, how much do they think about food? How do they feel about their bodies? Are they comparing themselves to other people? Um, those are really some things that you can start to ask. And even honestly, if someone's coming to you and saying that they think they might have something, um, one of the things you can say is just like, say more, like, tell me more, like, what's like, just don't lead. Like, it's hard to ask a leading question. Right. But like, just say more, like, tell me more can be helpful. Um, and kind of mirroring back. Cause I like kind of not leading them. Yeah. The yeah. empathetic listening model, you know, trying to say, I hear what you're saying and it sounds like you're struggling. Um, tell me more, tell me more what you're saying. Yeah. That's how we train our, you know, we, when we're training our support group leaders, our volunteers is really that empathetic listening and making it, you might not have the experience yourself, but you're hearing what they're saying, what people are saying. Um, it's really powerful. It's so powerful, isn't it? We don't listen. <laughs> we really, yeah, it's so powerful. And not trying to fix it, but listening and caring and then kind of getting to solutions, you know, but like caring for the person first, yeah. And the joke always is we should get all the, our husbands to take that, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> it happens every time. Um, and for our, the men on here, or yeah, I'm just kidding, I promise. <laughs> um, this is a really good, It's this is very interesting. It, Talking about um, hunger cues, there's a, a a comment I heard a nutritionist say once that hunger cues are like someone knocking at the door. That's really interesting. Eventually, if you ignore it enough, they'll stop knocking. When recovering from disordered eating at first, whoa, um, uh, it may be necessary to eat when you're not hungry on a schedule in order to reestablish hunger cues. Yes. And that's exactly what I meant when I was saying not everyone's ready to do intuitive eating tomorrow because you have to be able to reestablish those hunger fullness cues. And eventually you can't tell. Like I remember when I was going through treatment, literally in tears, like yelling at my therapist because I was like, five-year-olds are better at eating than me. Like, and I was so frustrated because I was like, I don't know when I'm hungry. I don't know what I feel. I don't like, I had gotten so numbed that I like couldn't remember. And it really is working with somebody to help you retrain and re-listen. And for a while, you just eat your meals and snacks because you're told to, and you don't listen to your body and you just get regulated with what, you know, your body needs some sense of. And then from there, you start to kind of heal, um, your relationship with food for sure, but you can't just do it overnight. And it does require, we call it refeeding. I mean, it's definitely to gain weight. It kind of depends, but it depends on the refeeding process for somebody. There's one in here that I'm going to send to you directly, Christy, um, sure. with the per with her email address. Perfect. Um, yeah, I would love to help with any referrals. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, are there any more questions that we can help answer? We will. Be, this is being recorded. I think you all saw that as you came in. Um, we'll have it up on our YouTube channel. Um, Esther, can you go ahead and put the survey up in the chat, please? Um, we do ask, uh, and you will get it in the email if you don't do it now. Um, if you could fill out a survey for us, um, it's important to us. We do offer all of our services for free uh, at no cost. And the, one of the ways we do that is through our generous um, donors and um, other supporters. They like surveys. They like the survey results. So um, that's how we get to continue to offer things at no cost. So I ask if everyone could fill out that survey. It should only take you a few minutes. Um, we will be following up via email with um, Rock Recovery's contact information, Christy's contact information, the slide deck, if that's okay with Christy. Um, and if anyone has any other questions, please, please let us know and we can pass them along. Um, we do have more education events coming up. Wednesday is our 
uh, the first of two citizen advocacy trainings. Um, the other one is March 6th, uh, getting ready for all the budget hearings coming up. And then there'll be plenty more after that. I think we have one in April on hoarding. Um, and then May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So there's a lot. Um, so Christy, this was fantastic. Yes. Oh, I don't, how do you say your Myra. name? Myra. Myra? Myra. Yes. So um, I did, sorry, and this is not about the disordered eating part, but um, you mentioned something coming up on Wednesday. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Because it sounded interesting. Um, Stop the recording really quick. Yes, please.